Sorry guys. It's still not to you. <laughs> okay, so the story about this song is about how the man thinks that he owns everything. And um, that I feel like something's changing, which is definitely uh, words in that song. Um, and, you know, no matter what he says, what he does, it's, the, it's about the people. And the people are the ones that um, have any kind of claims on anything that I really don't feel like we own anything in this world, but it's all borrowed. Um, and, you know, the future is kind of why we do things. It's not necessarily for immediate satisfaction. We're kind of doing things for the future. But anyways, I'll try this one more time. I'll play this little song and then they can get going with the program.
as second most in percentage. Nebraska is 100% public power, but there's fewer of them, so we actually have more people here. So 55% of the state gets public power. Now, it wasn't always like that. In the 1800s, companies came in, offered power where they thought they could make money. Uh, and public power started because the people realized in the late 1800s that they needed to fight back against investor-owned utilities who were putting profits ahead of a comprehensive quality service. Washington's first public electric utilities were the cities. Citizens were fed up with high prices and poor service from the private utilities. And so Seattle, Port Angeles, and Tacoma created public utilities in the 1890s, so over 100 years ago. Because of that, and actually you can go on the web and there are pictures of two sets of power lines going through Seattle. And <laughs> but once there was competition, prices went down because the public, for lots of reasons, public power didn't need to make a profit and they were selling power at cost and they drove the prices down. Well, in the 1920s, the Washington Grange was frustrated because the same problem with high prices and the lack of service was happening out in smaller cities and rural counties. And they, they saw that they were looking at the success of public power in the cities, and they wanted to create a model that they could use everywhere in Washington. Well, they went to the state legislature, who, uh, being a conservative bunch and uh, beholden to uh, corporate money, didn't want to do anything. Uh, the state had created an initiative process, which is a whole story in itself, but the, initiative, the, the referendum initiative process was created in 1912, the Washington Grange and the Washington Federation of Labor teamed up to run it through the legislature. And so by 1930, there had been a couple of um, uh, initiatives, and the Grange were getting nowhere with this uh, legislature, so they created an initiative to create public utility districts. Initiative one in 1930, gave it to the legislature, who did nothing, and they gave it to the voters, where it won by a very large margin, 55 to 45, roughly. Now, um, you know, it's, I, there's a really nice little video, I'm going to show you about a four minute video from the Washington Public Utility District Association that actually will tell you a little bit about the history of the PUDs better than I can, and I'll come back and tell you more about third PUD when that's done. The year was 1930. The Continental Baking Company introduced sliced Wonder Bread, 3M began marketing Scotch Transparent Tape, and here in Washington, voters went to the polls to approve the idea of community-owned public utility districts to provide electricity and water to communities across the state. A year earlier, the Washington State Grange, a populist agricultural organization, had collected more than 60,000 signatures, twice the necessary number, to send an initiative to the legislature. And when the legislature failed to act, the measure went to a statewide election, where it passed with 54% of the vote. Known as Initiative No. 1, the law authorized the establishment of public utility districts to conserve the water and power resources of the state of Washington for the benefit of the people thereof, and to supply public utility service, including water and electricity, for all uses. In the year 2000, as access to the internet became increasingly important for commerce and education, the law would be amended to include wholesale telecommunication service. Today, there are 28 public utility districts in Washington, serving the needs of more than 1.7 million customers. 23 PUDs provide electricity. Several own their own generating facilities, including dams on the Columbia River while others buy all or most of their power from the Bonneville Power Administration. 19 provide water or sewer services. And a growing number of PUDs are providing access to broadband telecommunications. The first PUD to go into operation was PUD No. 1 of Mason County. Formed in 1934, the PUD began serving Hoodsport and the surrounding area in 1935. A second PUD, Mason PUD No. 3, was formed about the same time and began operating soon afterwards, providing electricity to other parts of the county. Mason continues to be the only county in Washington with two operating PUDs. In 1934, voters in Benton and Franklin counties also approved the first countywide PUDs. 
Early efforts to organize public utility districts often faced fierce opposition at the ballot box from private utilities. But after the state Supreme Court upheld the PUD law in 1936, the Grange unleashed an all-out effort to get PUDs on the ballot. Although not all of them were immediately put into operation, 15 PUDs were created by the voters over the next four years, including Chelan, Clark, Cowlitz, Douglas, Ferry, Grant, Grays Harbor, Jefferson, Kitsap, Kittitas, Klickitat, Lewis, Okanagan, Pacific, Ponderé, Skagit, Skamania, Snohomish, Stevens, Thurston, Wakayakum, and Whatcom County. Clallam County PUD followed in 1944. The newest PUD is the Asotan County PUD. The PUD was created in 1984 by local voters who were upset with the high cost of water provided by a private utility. After two years of court proceedings, the PUD acquired the Clarkston General Water Supply through condemnation and began operation in April 1987. Public utility districts are community-owned, non-profit organizations. They provide cost-based services. Each is governed by an independent, locally elected board of commissioners who serve six-year terms. This local control and local accountability has been a guiding principle from the beginning. The growth of public utility districts in Washington coincides with the creation of the Bonneville Power Administration. Soon after the first public utility districts were organized, 34 PUD commissioners gathered in 1936 at the State Grange headquarters in Seattle to form a trade association. Initially known as the Washington Public Utility Commissioners Association, we are now the Washington Public Utility Districts Association. We represent the interests of our members, the 27 operating PUDs and Energy Northwest in Olympia, the Northwest Region, and Washington, D.C. In 2006, our members authorized the association to build a new headquarters building in Olympia. We broke ground in 2006, and in 2007, we dedicated the building you see today. Modern, energy efficient, and designed to lead the association into the future just as our PUD members are prepared to meet the needs of their communities. So let me tell you a little bit about Thurston PUD. Um, as the video notes, they were part of that first wave of PUDs and they were created by the citizens of Thurston County in 1938. Efforts to create a public power utility started in 1939. So they were trying to do this for a long time. Over the course of the first 20 years of its existence, the PUD tried to dump several different partnerships with other PUDs, fought numerous lawsuits, and had the commission, the three-member commission that governed them, swinging between pro-public power and anti-acquisition commissioners. Over the course of the 20 years, the PUD was threatened by the, so over the course of those 20 years, the PUD was threatened by the fact that it was a non-operating utility. It existed on paper, but they had no <coughs> systems. In 1956, local residents petitioned the PUD to take over a water system. A local developer, Mr. Alvin Thompson, sold his system to the PUD, which became the Tanglewild Thompson Place System, which now serves Lita Hawk School and has over 12,000 customers in that neighborhood. In the early 1960s, the PUD began procedures for condemnation of PSLNE, as it was called, the predecessor of PSD. Then one of the commissioners died and the board was split one to one. Meanwhile, there was a massive public debate about whether the public should vote before the PUD became an electric utility. This upheaval got bigger and bigger, it reached the legislature. There's a whole story there about Slade Gordon and um, uh, various other uh, characters who became much more famous in later time uh, fighting over this. John, I think John L. O'Brien got kicked out of his job because of this fight and all kinds of things happened. And the end result was that the, um, the current law was passed which requires a non-electric PUD 
to win authorization in a public vote before it could provide electric service. So the next two decades were relatively quiet. In 1990, the Thurston PUD commissioners decided to dissolve the PUD. This required a vote of the people, and Thurston County voters saved the PUD by rejecting dissolution by a solid majority. And the winning argument, as I understand it, and Jim could correct me, was that the PUD was the county's insurance against misbehavior by PSE. And Jim says that's true. <laughs> Voter pamphlet statement. He wrote the voter pamphlet statement. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that comes up to my involvement. In 2000, I was elected a Thurston PD commissioner, and that's a whole other story that I won't bore you tonight. Knowing that citizens wanted a viable PD, and knowing that the need for water, a public water utility, and I'm a water person, I got talking to the county, and they said, wow, we have all these water problems, a PD would be great. So um, I got elected, I proposed the PUD, write a business plan. Um, the other commissioners agreed with me, we voted, we hired a, co a consultant, we wrote a business plan, and based on the plan we hired a general manager, and the general manager took over operation of the Tango Well Thompson Place system, which for the last 20 years had been run by basically the city, we contracted with the city of Olympia to provide water and run the system. The people lived there thought the city of Olympia owned the system, but it didn't, the PUD owned it. Beauty took over the system, but then had an opportunity to buy a system uh, from a person who um, had a, not a very good reputation. The Department of Health was very happy. But we bought the company and got, I think, like 100 and some systems and all, most of their staff, some really good staff that are still there today. So the first, for the first time, the Beauty was fully operational with a professional staff and a solid revenue stream. So since then, the Beauty has continued to purchase private and homeowner systems it currently owns and operates 275 water systems and serves almost 8,000 families in Thurston and neighboring counties. So, so that brings us today, but I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, the issue of becoming an electric utility arose again in 2012. Yes. And um, some of you might remember that. Is anybody here involved in the 2012 campaign? There we go, quite a few. Um, I'm going to invite Guy up here, who was the vice chair of the campaign in 2012, to tell you a little bit about a little reminiscing on the fun they had back then. So I, I kind of went through a a progression in uh, supporting the PUD's uh, initiative in 2012. Um, I had gone and I attended a UTC meeting because I was uh, really irritated by the fact that uh, uh, that the PSE was asking for a rate increase. And uh, I realized at that time that the, uh, U the Utility and Trade Commission was somewhat compromised. Uh, they seemed to never want to deny PSE any kind of uh, a rate increase at the time. And so I went and I talked to some friends. One of them happened to be a uh, PUD commissioner, and he invited me to go up to a meeting that they were having to form a, a campaign to uh, allow the PUD to electrify. Uh, we went up to a pizza parlor. It was Apollo's, I believe. Um, met a number of times up there. You know, Paulus was, was really cordial to us. The only thing we had to do was buy a pizza and beer, and uh, they were perfectly willing to let us meet up there. Um, we started to look into what uh, PSE had been doing over the num uh, last number of years. Uh, besides the rate increases, we realized that they were bringing in power from Montana coal facilities. Uh, we realized that uh, they had just recently been bought out by a foreign consortium that uh, obviously had huge debt that needed to be paid off. So, you know, it seemed real clear to us that our rates were going to go up to pay for that debt. Um, we were also uh, had a number of people, and myself included, that were very much concerned about uh, global climate change. And we thought that a publicly owned electrical system in Thurston County could uh, provide alternatives to uh, the coal-fired plants and other uh, uh, electrical generating systems, uh, such as uh, uh, gas, that uh, 
could potentially contribute to this problem. Um, we, we thought that maybe the, uh, the, the PUD could act as kind of a seed to uh, allow a di diversification of electrical generation uh, by giving uh, small loans to homeowners to install their own solar. Uh, all these ideas were floating around, so then we began our campaign. Uh, the campaign was very grassroots. Let me tell you, you may not believe how grassroots it was. <laughs> Thomas Gobler. <Yeah. Gobler. laughs> Tom, Tom was a member, and certainly um, there were a number of other people that contributed huge amounts of time, more than I can possibly believe. Uh, they went out, and uh, the very first thing we had to do, of course, was to gather uh, a number of signatures. I believe it was 12,000. We actually gathered 15. Uh, 15,000 signatures put us on the ballot, and then we had even a, a, a more difficult road to hoe, and that was the form of campaign. Uh, we were impoverished, and it was very difficult to raise funds. But we did manage to raise so, uh, slightly under $40,000. Of course, as you may realize, at the time, PSE raised, uh, or they put more than $600,000 into their campaign to oppose the uh, PUD. We uh, met, did the best we could. I mean, I, I felt excitement. I felt uh, that there were, that we had support. But unfortunately, we did fail. It was uh, approximately 60 to 40. But I, th I think that we can take a positive look at that. 60 to 40 means that we only need to get 10% more people in the county. And I think that that is something that we can do now, this year. And I'm also of the opinion that we can continue this until we finally do produce a public utility, electrification of the public utility. I think it serves everybody's interests. I think that it'll uh, actually provide us with a number of levers that we can use to uh, re keep our rates within uh, reasonable bounds, to uh, allow us to go off of carbon source fuels, to, uh, you know, there, there is a, a double entente to the idea of a, a public power utility. It's, it means that we are in control and that we are the people that can decide our own fate. And I think that that is the most important aspect of all of this. So at, at, at that point, I'm going to pass this on to another young lady who is going to talk to us. Um, her name is Riona Keaton de Vargas, and she is uh, a member of the Olympia chapter of uh, Youth Cl Climate, Climate Strike. And uh, she is a student at Olympia High School and also attends uh, SPSCC. Uh, and so I will turn it over to her right now. I'm um, here supporting this fantastic public power launch on behalf of Olympia Youth Climate Strikes. Where I work alongside, where I work alongside Eliana Kaye and Madison Hall, who cannot be here tonight, as a part of Washington Youth Climate Strikes, um, which is a 100% youth-run conservation organization. We're a group of concerned teenagers from all different backgrounds who, along with young people from across the globe, inspired by Greta Thunberg's strikes. Here's standing up for our futures and for the world. We organize strikes and other events across Washington to, dem to demand that those in power take radical action to stop the climate crisis and its effects. The world is running against the clock and we refuse to let our le leaders make irresponsible decisions on issues that affect us the most, as do you. And I would like to thank you all for being here and taking matters into your own hands. <laughs> Your support and participation is essential to the people and groups like Public Power who are taking on the lives of corruption and waste. All of you here understand that climate change isn't just a line on a graph to be taken care of by scientists or senators. You know that climate change is right here, right now, and it is in every individual's hands. It is your, and your, and your, just those three people's, <laughs> <laughs> responsibility to make sure that we don't trigger the next mass extinction. 
We are the ones who are shaking the industries, the politicians, and the world awake. We are taking the steps together and creating a planet that we can all be proud of. So thank you all, and thank you to the Thurston Public Power Initiative and to Dennis Kucinich. Well, this is what you really came here for. We were just a warm-up act, and, uh, but we've been really excited to have Dennis Kucinich come into our community. struggle my grandfather went through <laughs> 40, 41 years ago. Uh, and that struggle in Cleveland, that trailer, by the way, uh, at some point I hope you'll see the whole thing. But it is, um, uh, it is part of uh, the marketing plan for a 618-page book I wrote about this uh, battle to save Cleveland's municipal electric system so many years ago. And uh, this is archival footage from that, which we preserved uh, hundreds of hours of over the years, knowing that there would be people who would deny it ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> because something happened in 1978 where, uh, despite the fact that a bank told me that, despite the fact that a bank told me that if I, if I didn't agree to sell our Munich electric system, they would not renew the city's credit. And, and then I followed up, when they put the city into default, I followed up with a complaint to the Justice Department. The next day, the bank and the media supporting them said that never happened. <laughs> they gaslighted an entire town. Uh, and this, was, this is what makes this an incredible story. And uh, the book is finished. Uh, we're just uh, working with some people about publication and also talking to uh, a few of the uh, companies that uh, produce movies and series about serialization of the story. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Larry and, and the Olympia uh, Movement for uh, Justice and Peace for helping to sponsor this event. Yeah. And every, 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 uh, thank you. And I want to thank all of you for making the effort to be here this evening. This, uh, <clears throat> I, I have a slight cold and not contagious, but I'm, um, and I've been speaking a lot in the last few days here in, in the Olympia Thurston County area on behalf of this important initiative which we're talking about tonight, bringing public power to uh, Thurston County. <clears throat> When I became involved in the issue of public power, I just just got into city council in Cleveland. We're talking 50 years ago. And I found out about the history of public power in the city of Cleveland, how a mayor by the name of Tom Johnson, who was part of the progressive movement in the United States of America at the turn of the 20th century, who the writer Lincoln Stephens described as the best mayor of the best governed city in the United States. All right. He founded a, a, a muni life. And he did it with a philosophy in mind. And here's what he said. It's a quote from him. He said, I believe in the public ownership of public service facilities, such as parks, waterworks, and electric systems, because if you do not own them, they will in time own you. They'll rule your politics, corrupt your institutions, and finally destroy your liberties. So Tom Johnson, who took a stand for public power in Cleveland 110 years ago, understood the primacy of economic justice 
the privacy of people having control over their own economic and social destiny. The importance of people being able to have local control over a utility. Why? So that they can be directly involved with those who are setting the rates. So they can insist on accountability on issues of reliability. So that they can see the money come back into the community yeah. and not be exported to Canada, the Netherlands, or God knows where. So that they can make sure that the power is used for business development in a community. Because that actually, way back when, was one of the prime reasons for the creation of public power, to help businesses. So that there would be an inexpensive source of power. So public power now emerges in a, in a new light. With the pressure on today's uh, climate, with atmospheric carbon levels going above uh, 415 parts per million, and I just want to say, uh, let's thank again the young people who are involved in the climate strike. Yes, and, and that effort. <laughs> thank you. With rising sea levels, with changes in migration patterns, with extraordinary changes in meteorological patterns, we have to understand that we are in a moment of crisis and it does, it requires a broad-based approach, and one of those approaches is municipalization, control of public power, and the ability to set environmental agendas through the control of public power, which are consistent with the concerns of the community. <laughs> Private power companies set their own agenda and they will access whatever power they can get at whatever price with whatever environmental consequences. But there's a new consciousness emerging. Not to, this region has always been a, a little bit ahead of many parts of the country when it comes to public power and when it comes to the importance of control. But here in Thurston County, you've had a battle. And the last one, I believe, was in 2012. And there was a, a battle royal, which uh, you were outspent uh, tremendously. Yes. But <clears throat> even now, in the last eight years, the situation has changed. Today, there is foreign ownership of, of this uh, private utility. And that does have consequences. The consequences are accountability. The consequences are alignment with the values of people in the community. The consequences are the need to be able to bring the, bring the profits back to the community, not in terms of, of cash, but in terms of lower electric rates, in terms of lower taxes, for charges for street lighting and city facilities. This is really a moment when the people of Thurston County have an opportunity in a very intimate way to take control of your destiny as a people and to step forward on behalf of this generation and future generations to set a marker and say no matter what the odds are, no matter how powerful this interest group is, because the people are organized, because they're committed to economic justice, this community will prevail and establish a public power system. There is an inherent right that people have to establish their own utilities. It's a right that's guaranteed by constitutions. It's a right that's guaranteed by home rule. And what happens is that over a period of time, utilities are able to get from municipal governments, this is the case in Ohio, franchises for 99 years or whatever, and they basically get the ability to operate uh, theoretically in exchange for reasonable rates and for reliable service. Uh, when that doesn't happen, the people must respond. You're not trapped, you're not slaves, you're not uh, held captive by, uh, by utilities. And the very idea that somehow, you know, you don't have any rights to push back, that's, that's fundamentally wrong. So, my presence here is, to, is coming from a, now a long and storied history of fighting on behalf of public power. 
and, and of saving the public power system. That Muni Light is now cleaning public power survived. Um, my mayoralty did not at that time, and it took me uh, 15 years to make a comeback. But I was brought back by the people of Cleveland when they understood that from the time I made that decision until, until 1993, that the people of Cleveland and the taxpayers of Cleveland saved hundreds of millions of dollars on their electric bills. I, I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm not just preaching to the choir, but the choir is singing for us. <laughs> and, and, and thank you. Hallelujah. Uh, so I, 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 it's great when you have musical company. Right? And uh, I mean, you know, I've longed for that. I always thought if I didn't go into politics, I've had a career in musical theater. I'm getting closer here. Uh, so what, I, what I'd like to do is to hear from you, hear your questions. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with the initiative that's being put forward here. And I certainly support the petition drive, and I hope that many of you will do the same. I hope that you will circulate petitions. I hope you will get this on the ballot for November and get a turnout on Thursday and, and make this county uh, uh, have a resounding statement in favor of not, not just public power generically, but of your own power, of your own ability to be able to say, this is my county, this is my city, I'm, I'm intent on, on reclaiming my rights and, and asserting that no one is going to uh, chart the destiny of this area's economy uh, from uh, thousands of miles uh, away in other countries. So, so if I, could, if I could ask right now, uh, uh, Bruce, are we good to, uh, Oops, sorry. Are, are we good to, uh, uh, for, for the, the Q&A right now? Yeah, let, if you want to take a short break, we'll have uh, collect cards, and Guy was going to talk a little bit about the campaign, and then we'll, we'll come back to Q&A just in, in a minute. Okay, so they're, they're going to collect cards, uh, and then uh, there's going to be a... Uh, Guy's going to talk about the campaign, and then I'm going to come back uh, and answer some questions. And again, thank you so much, each and every one of you, for being here. I love being in this area. Great to be here, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you more in the Q&A period. It's yours. Thank you. So, um, uh, this one, I got this. I, I project pretty well anyway. Uh, yeah, so someone's going to collect a card. I don't know who that's going to be. Uh, Paul. Lots all right. of people are. Katrina. So, I, you know, this, I, what Dennis just told us is so inspiring. Yeah. I mean, this is our moment to seize control of our destiny. We have a corporation that is more beholden to foreign stockholders than they are to the citizens of this county. And we need to understand that. It's time for us to come together to push for the, the, the utility that we deserve. And so um, I want you, uh, I'm going to mention that uh, some of you signed in tonight, but that is not actually the petition. So we, we need everybody here to sign that petition. We need everybody here to dedicate some time, effort, and perhaps a little bit of money to help us push this campaign forward. We, you need to talk to your neighbors. You need to talk to your family. You need to talk to your co-workers, if permissible. And we need to understand that this is a time to push this issue forward. So, uh, I hope that you are all writing down your questions. I'm sure that you all have some. Uh, you know, there are a number of different issues that need to be hashed out. But, you know, the first thing is, is to empower ourselves. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Paul, do you have some uh, Q&As here? 
So Dennis, yeah. we're going to turn it over to you. Yeah, there, there's like so many good questions, and I apologize to anyone. Um, do you want to answer? If I don't get to them, are you going to answer that? I'll read it, and you can answer. Is that something? Okay? Um, so I'll start with a really quick one. You have 30 seconds in an elevator. What would you tell people about why to vote yes for the PUD? Um, I actually run upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> really, no kidding. But anyhow, uh, the 30 seconds in the elevator pitch is this. The, it's local control. You can lower taxes. Uh, there's a chance you can have lower rates and promote business and bring the money back into the area. Is that 10 seconds? <laughs> and then there's more. Okay, um, here's, here's a quick one you can rattle up real quick. Um, are you gonna run for the 10th District Congressional seat? My district in Ohio was District 10. But then, then, then the uh, Democrats, the Democrats chopped it up. Think about that one. But, but let me just say this. I'm, I'm here on behalf of, of public power. And, and I'm here on behalf of the people of Olympia, Thurston, and, and, and your aspirations. And I'm very grateful to be here. So let's keep the focus on public power. Yes? A few of the questions are very, um, I don't think Dennis could answer. I'm going to keep these questions to make sure we put answers on our website. Some of them have to do with like, you know, where do we get the money and, and you can try and answer the question. Well, yeah, I mean, ask any question, you know, or maybe I'll just give the answer and then you can ask the question. <laughs> like a guy by the name of Johnny Carson. Well, they're just saying like, how do you, how do you get, where do you get the money, how, you know, who's going to, where do you get the employees, who's going to run it? Well, you, you issue revenue bonds. Uh, and, and every public utility has the ability to do that. And the revenue bonds are, are paid for, uh, you know, that's what people pay utility bills, you can use that money, part of it, to finance the system. As far as the workers... Local <laughs> jobs. But, jobs. Local jobs. Well, local jobs, but as far as the workers, uh, you probably will want some of the people who are currently working for the utility. They, they know how to do it. So it's... it's it's not unusual to, to do that. The other thing that I would recommend, which you know, I fought for in Cleveland, we were able to maintain, is to make sure it's, it, people are paid union wages. Yes. That's credit. Yeah. So, so you don't you want to make sure of that. But there are about 2,000, at least 2,000, publicly owned utilities in America. And of course, Washington State has you know, more public utility districts I think that any state in America, yeah. about 28. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, an anomaly. Matter of fact, uh, Thurston County would be one of the, is one of the few counties that has not uh, moved forward with some kind of a, uh, with an electric system or has not had, is that right, that you have it? Thurston County uh, had the opportunity in 2012, they did, you know, they voted against it. Right. But uh, Thurston County uh, is, um, how, how many counties do you have in Washington State that don't have, uh, that don't have public use, utilities of any kind? Um, you know, I, I would just, off the top of my head, about half. Uh, okay. A little less than half. Next, uh, next question. Okay. Um, so, trying to bunch a few that are similar. Um, people were asking about uh, if we're going to have climates going to create more storms. Um, we so maybe you can comment about the differences between a public power and PSC and how they respond to a storm or an emergency, electric loss emergency. Well, I, I've heard from people in the last few days that I've been here that there's a question of reliability in certain areas. I mean, yeah. anybody yeah. vouch for that? Oh, yeah. 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 Show of hands. Okay, well, my car was off three hours today. Oh my God! Wow. My car was off three hours. Today. Wow. What do you mean? Why? The thing said that uh, equipment is problem. Where do you live? Uh, off Sky Ridge, off of uh, Pacific. Okay. And do they explain? And, 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 like, and do they explain to you why when you call? No. It, oh, you're gonna just report online, and, and, uh, and they've done it instead of equipment. 
Okay, well, if there's equipment failure, then that means that the equipment has to be uh, improved, <laughs> has to be fixed. It may have to be renewed, may have to purchase new equipment. Well, that's part of operating a utility, duh. And you know, this is something that you have a right to get control of. And if you have reliability issues, and I'd like to show hands again, how many people here are concerned about the reliability? Okay, I want you to look at each other. Wow. This is extraordinary, really. I, and this, is, this might be one of the principal issues in your campaign, that reliability. Because, look, it's one thing to have an issue defeated in 2012, but if you have continuing problems with the reliability, then you have to defeat the utility and, and make reliability one of the cardinal principles of your own Thurston County uh, public power. So this is something you have a chance to do. You know, I, I remember, you know, one of my, one of my nightmares as a uh, member of city council was getting, getting calls about power outages. Because, you know, what happens? You, you know, we're in a modern society, you refrigerate food, some people have electric equipment, they need running, you might be working on a computer, you might lose a file, whatever. There's a lot of things that are complicated when power goes out. What happened in Cleveland, by the way, and this is part of the story they're telling, is that we discovered when the private power company wanted to build nuclear power plants and we objected to it and they had to open up their case files, we discovered that outages that occurred during holidays were being deliberately engineered by the private power company so that they could force the public uh, into a mood where they wanted to sell the municipal electric system. They were creating outages on the public power system. Yep. Oh. Sabotaging it. So this is part of the story. It's a wild story. And, and, and so the shenanigans that go on with private control of power are, can be endless. But when you have public control, you have, the, you have accountability. The commissioners are accountable. The political system is accountable. And there's no accountability in a private system, none. I mean, the only accountability is the extent to which losing customers will affect their profits. Uh, next question. Okay, uh, I've got a couple that are quite similar. What is the most effective strategy for gaining public support for an electrified PUD? And what kind of very um, creative acts can we engage in to inform and influence the public so that we get seen? Yeah, there, there is nothing more creative than knocking on the door. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that is the ultimate creativity in political uh, and public campaign. Go directly to people. You know, it, it, and, and also as a backup, because we, you know, we have the internet today, we didn't have that years ago. Uh, those who are, are skilled in using the internet and social media, and in creating videos and editing those videos, you can do a lot to help spread the message. There's different ways to spread the message. You're no longer captive as people were generations ago. You have new tools. So I'd say every way you can do it, but begin by making it face-to-face, -face, neighbor to neighbor. If you're achieving outages and you're experiencing that, suffering that, your neighbors are, are experiencing the same thing. During the petition drive, that's an issue. These outages, we're done with them, we're going to have an electric system that you don't have to worry about whether you're going to have power one day to the next. And, and so that's one of the things you do. You, you have to, you communicate with your neighbors about it. Ultimately, they're the ones we need to vote in order to okay the creation of a public power system. And, and, and the outages, you can't lie about that, they've happened. Yeah. This is like a real experience, this isn't made up. This isn't a campaign marketing thing. This is about real experience, which is essential for you to communicate with your neighbors and say, hey, we're fed up with this. And, and then there's other things that come into play. That's really, that's really a significant way to do it. But I, uh, and, and you don't need a lot of money to do this. It doesn't cost you anything to knock on the door. It doesn't cost you anything to send an email. You know, these are things that, that you can run a campaign today on, on less than nothing. And frankly, you know, that's what we did to save our municipal power system in Cleveland because we actually had an election. Check this out. We had an election where I had to put, I decided to put the question to the people. There were polls taken ahead of the election that showed that we were going to lose two to one. Two to one. 
and I called upon then Ralph Nader, who you all know about. He came to Cleveland to help out. We had a public campaign to beat them all, and, and, and in a period of six weeks, when have you ever heard of a poll showing two to one, an issue's gonna be defeated? We won by two to one, as a result of going directly to the people. This is, this is why you, you, you can and you will win if you unite, and if you use whatever is at your disposal to reach out and talk to people, and talk to the businesses too. It's really important to reach out to businesses and get them on your side. Because in the past, they may have been reluctant to participate. But the ball game's changed in the last eight years. And, and businesses, they want reliability. Businesses want to be uh, guaranteed that the economic climate of an area is gonna grow. And if you start putting money back into the community, that can only help. If you can keep taxes down, that's good for business because whatever the street lighting costs, whatever city facilities are being, uh, uh, char are charging the taxpayers for lighting, all those can be kept at, a, at, a, at the lowest rate and that benefits the taxpayers. And then as you set up a public system, you want to run it in such a way as to keep the rates as low as possible and you have a lot better chance to do that when you, you have a system that doesn't have to pay uh, exorbitant uh, 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 fees to or, or salaries to executives or uh, pay shareholders their dividends. Uh, it's a different kind of system, a different kind of thinking. And it's as American as apple pie because there are public power systems all over the country. Next question. Thank you. Thank you. This is kind of an open question here. And it little, you know, if we're successful and the PUD, you have public power now in the county, what are some of the ways that a PUD can bring innovation to our community? Endless, uh, literally endless. You, you, you're limited only by your imagination. To, to reach out and, and to be a force for green, for green power, for the green of power, uh, to, and, and that's something that, think about this, you can actually be involved in this. Citizens can get together and start to imagine and reimagine what a power system can do in a community. And, and this is the beauty of it. You actually have control over it. Instead of being supplicants to a private company saying, don't hurt us, you, you, you're no longer victims. You're in a position of being empowered, literally empowered, to uh, control your own destiny. So uh, there's no limitation to what can be done. So I had a couple questions that were uh, related to the Green New Deal. And um, kind of, one question is, um, will the PUD, would, could the PUD, well, I'll just read the question. With 15% of electricity lost in power lines, will the PUD support Green New Deal-like changes that are uncomfortable to many, such as neighborhood densification? Um, and then, I guess the flip side is, well, what are your criticisms of the Green New Deal? Well, well, first of all, the Green New Deal does not actually, is not actually expressed in a legislative program. It's a series of aspirations. Um, when I was running for president in 2004, I brought forth what I call the Green Works Administration, which was modeled after FDR's uh, Work Progress Administration. And that was aimed at, at looking at the entire economy and how we could begin the greening of it. Uh, we know there's an emergency today. There's just no question about it. Uh, the Green New Deal, it's good that they're talking about the need to take a new direction. And, and I'm, I support that. But we need a legislative agenda to make something happen. Uh, what I'm in favor of, and, and see, this is where the planning starts to change. We need people to become involved in finding ways where all of us can reduce our carbon footprint. One way that I do it is I'm a vegan, you know? And there's a, you know, I have a lot of reasons for that, but, you know, there's ways that we can all make choices to lower our carbon footprint. And what happens is, when the community is involved in controlling its own destiny, you develop an environmental consciousness so that every choice you make is aimed at what can I do to lower the carbon footprint. You know, you go to a supermarket, you carry things out without a bag if you can do it. You know, just little things like that. And, and each one of us has had the experience of, you know, we think, well, what can I do to, to protect uh, the, uh, the climate? And, and so one of the things that I'm talking about and that I'm promoting is this. Uh, there's three different ways that I've actually been working on in the year and a half that I've been away from any kind of politics at all, 
and one is to grow a certain kind of grass that will sequester about 18 to 20 percent of carbon in the soil. It's a fast-growing grass that'll, it's called C4 grass, it'll grow um, 8 to 10 feet. And then when you harvest it, you have a carbon negative fuel. And so if you go in a direction, if you can do this at scale for millions of acres, you can have a positive effect on, on holding down the rate of increase of atmospheric carbon. There's other areas that, that I'm personally working on. One is to turn um, waste into uh, alcohol. Uh, what kind of alcohol? Fuel grade alcohol, which uh, uh, has, uh, in some cases, a carbonless burn. Uh, uh, food grade alcohol, which is already used in liquor stores, and pharmaceutical alcohol. I mean, so you know, there are different uses for it. There's another area, which is the creation of waste to green jet fuel. Today at Los Angeles, LAX, there's, uh, there's one fuel supply where the fuel is being merged with a different kind of uh, jet fuel which has less of a carbon uh, content. And it's the product of, of a certain type of materials and waste and these technologies are beginning to change. So, you know, the, what I'd like to see is, a, is helping farmers, particularly smaller farmers, farm carbon, literally, and get paid for it. And, and, but in order, in order to do that, we have to break up the monopoly in agriculture. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of the real. So, so, and, and another project that I'm involved in that you know you'll probably be hearing about that by the end of the year is to create a, uh, a global environmental network so that we can reach out to communities around the world and actually show people what's being done in community after community around the world and, and enable people to model it, replicate it. You know, the whole world needs to be involved. And so there are, and, and here in, in Thurston, here in Olympia, the creation of, of a public uh, power system can be the step that this community takes towards underscoring your interest in environmental consciousness by taking control of your own destiny on, on power. So just the beginning, and it's, just, it's, a, it's one way, but there are many ways. And, and, and that's why the voices of young people who realize the threat, the future always know when the place that's being prepared for is being threatened. And we're hearing the voices of the future now. And we need to pay attention to that. We need to be ready to defend their interests. And in some, in some way, however small it may seem on, seem on a global scale, when people in Thurston take a, a, a stand for public power and for environmental integrity, which can parallel public power's uh, implementation, you then uh, start to create a whole new discussion in the county about the direction the county can't go in and a whole range of environmental initiatives, one of which, one of which is public power. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis told me earlier he's a grade A student top of his class. I think we can tell. Uh, uh, what? You said you were a grade A student and you were the top no, of your class. Well, what I said was this. I, I have to put this in perspective. When I fought to save Cleveland's municipal electric system, the Cleveland establishment did not forgive me. I lost the election as a result of that battle. People didn't understand why the city went into the fault. People didn't even know what the fault was. We were the only city in America to ever go into default since the Great Depression at that point. People did not understand. I couldn't get a job after that. And, and, what I, and how, how this comes up, Paul, is that I graduated from Case Western Reserve uh, master's program with a straight A average. And I still couldn't get a job, didn't matter. Because I, I challenged this, this power. Now what you didn't see, you saw the, um, uh, the uh, mafia hitman who was, said he was promised 80,000, which then was probably worth about 300 today. Um, you, you saw that, but what it didn't say, this is, how, this is how big the stakes are in, in, in fighting for public power. Um, there were three assassination attempts, real attempts. And, you know, I'm here today by the grace of God. I, can't, I cannot say, I really can't say any other reason. One, one high power rifle shot missed my head by inches. And an and a assassination was planned. According to a U.S. Senate subcommittee on organized crime in the Midwest, 
they determined that an assassination plot was hatched and intended to be executed when I was the Grand Marshal in a parade in Cleveland, and the only reason I didn't go to that parade is I ended up being rushed to the hospital with a bleeding ulcer that almost killed me. So, you know, this is life, this is fate, this is the intertwining of all kinds of possibilities. But the backdrop of this was the, the system was so much controlled by banks and utilities. The bank that refused to renew the city's credit and the utility were actually business partners. They had interlocking directorates. They held uh, positions on each other's boards. The bank, uh, uh, the utility had demand deposits of 25 million at the time in the bank. Uh, it owned, it owned a, uh, a major uh, share of the stock, a major stockholder of the utility, the bank was. And, and, and each of the media in Cleveland, the bank and the utility were both major advertisers with the TV and the radio stations and the newspapers. So I took on the whole town. It wasn't just, you know, like, but let me just state this. Uh, um, I'm not really, in truth, I'm, I'm not any different from that young mayor who said, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going along with crooks. Uh, because you, you have to take a stand. Now, just imagine, every one of us has a moment in our lives where we have to take a stand. Mm -hmm. And I think you're, you may be approaching such a moment in Thurston. And, and all, all you need is a little bit of courage. And, and courage opens, what I have found in my life is courage opens every door. Just a little bit of courage. You know, we're told if you have the faith of a, of a grain of mustard, the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can move mountains. I found that to be true. If you have the smallest amount of courage, there is nothing that you, can, you cannot achieve. So I, and, for, and I speak now, I really speak from experience. Uh, and, and it's not that I'm so different than anybody else. I come out of the neighborhoods of the city of Cleveland. I still live in a house in Cleveland that I bought in 1971 for $22,500. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, really. I mean, it's, this, is, you know, this is where I come from. And I, and I still remember growing up in the city. So you understand why this is important. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I grew up the oldest of seven. My parents never owned a home. They were renters. As the family grew from one to seven, we had trouble finding rent. So by the time I was 17, we lived in 21 different places, including a couple cars. I remember my parents. In one apartment we lived in at 10712 St. Clair above Martha's Delicatessen, a two-room apartment for six people. I remember them counting pennies on a, on a chip porcelain table and they'd count the pennies to be able to pay bills, and particularly electric bills. I remember that. I remember hearing the pennies drop, you know, click, click, click on the table. I remember that. And when I was being told by the banker, you have to sell this electric system, or you're not going to uh, have the city's credit renewed on loans I hadn't even taken out, I, my thinking was back at that apartment. I was with my parents as they were counting pennies. It matters what people pay for electricity. Oh, yes. It matters. You, you, have to be, you have to be able to take a stand for yourself on this. In this case, I was called upon to take a stand for the people of Cleveland. And, and frankly, you know, uh, they, they now appreciate it very much, and I'm grateful for that. So let's, uh, next question. You know, I have, I have two that are similar, and they really are great follow-up on that one. One is, um, when promoting public power, the question of savings come up, how might consumers in the region stand to save versus PFC in the early years of public power in the county. Let me read the second one here. Does the process you propose include all the citizens of the county that are at risk for their livelihoods? Your zeal is encouraging, I am at risk senior citizen, barely surviving on a small pension. What, what do you, I, whoever asked that question, help me with this, because I want to understand exactly what you mean. Uh, if, if you don't want to raise your hand, that's okay. Oh, does anyone? We left. Okay. We left. Okay. Yeah. But what, what? Read it one more time. I just want to see if I understand what you're saying. The, well, okay. So does the process you include, propose include all the citizens of Thurston County that are at risk for their livelihoods? Where's that? Where's that? Well, they're, they're, I think they're saying he has, he's living on a small pension. He's got fixed income. 
So how will this help people living on a very small fixed income? So well, well, here's the thing. Yeah, you know, the, the electric system has the ability to be able to establish rates, and you can have you can have a special rate if you want to for people who are economically deprived. That's possible. This is the beauty of it. You can do that. Will a private utility do that? No. Right. So this is so that's the first that's the answer to the first part. What's the second part of the question? Um, well, that was that was that's basically the question. And the other one was just in general. You know, what are the ways that, that uh, public power can save us money? Talk a little bit about. Well, part of the campaign, I would have to say this: is people are running the campaign. Create a, create a rate sheet. You, you may not see savings the first year. I because look, I have not done a rate study. That takes a little bit of work. Of of the private company versus what you can uh, charge here. But do, but do, there needs to be some effort made to show people what, what it looks like in year one, year two, three, four, five. That's not hard to do. You need some accountants who will help in the campaign. But you need to make that case. You, you need to show people how it benefits them. And it's not hard to do. I mean, first of all, there, it's almost impossible to have an electric system that would lose money, public electric system. And uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, I would do some research on the private company, how, what their profits are out of this area. Because they have to make certain filings, and you can get a pretty good estimate, and tell people, you know, you'll bring this money back into the community. You'll bring the profits back into the community in terms of the, the money will stay here. Right, to have your own utility. Next question. Well, there's a couple here that are, you know, you're, you have a very broad view of, these are a little more out of the region, but I think they're very interesting questions, and you can decide how far you want to go with this. One was uh, a question about PGE in Northern California, the bankruptcy they went through oh, because of all the buyers. Yeah. So do you think, how has the failure of PGE in Northern California changed accountability for private utilities? Well, in, in, the volume has changed in California. I'm hoping for a meeting with Governor Newsom next week uh, on this issue. Uh, the, the fact that you had an entire town wiped out in, in Northern California because of uh, the negligence of the yeah. private utility. Um, heartbreaking, absolutely crushing and heartbreaking. Um, when, when you know that your uh, work can affect people's lives, you, you have to have due diligence and clear the lines and make sure that uh, if there's fire hazards uh, that you take care of them. That's part of your responsibility for operating a utility. And so I think what's happening is uh, there is a chance that the state of California may take over PG&E. California has... Uh, and, and California has tremendous resources to, to do that. And, and what you do, you basically condemn their facilities and uh, set the price, negotiate the price, or go to court and have a court set the price. And once you come to an agreement, you, you uh, issue the, you set the time period for the takeover and the time period for the payment of, of taking over the facilities. Uh, people want control over their, their lives. And utility, private utilities are not always responsive to the concerns that people have. And so we're, we're at a point where you have these mammoth corporations that are making decisions in distant places that affect our lives. I mean, here's, here's one chance, one chance that the people of Thurston have to respond to that and, and, and send a message, not just across the state of Washington, but send a message to the rest of the country, saying we're just going to take control of our own destiny. And then, all, then every other corporation has to look and start to think, well, you know, maybe, maybe we can control the people the way we used to. I, I think there's this restlessness happening in the country right now. And, and we have to be careful of the climate, the political climate that's turning people against each other. It doesn't work in our favor, frankly. The polarization works against us. We have to find common bond with each other, whatever our political philosophy. We have to close ranks with the community. We're not Republicans and Democrats and Independents. We're, we're one people, we're a community. And we can have different philosophies, we can have different religions, but we're one people. And we have to, uh, we have to, that has to be our highest calling as a community. Because when it is, then we can do anything. We can achieve anything. But if people divide us, if we let the politics of the moment divide us, we, 
it's very difficult to be able to move forward. And I think we can, I, I think this is the moment where we can consciously make a decision that, that the unity of, of Thurston is, is the paramount importance and everything else is secondary when it comes to the welfare and the economic rights of the people here. All right. <laughs> Plenty of time to stay here. How are you doing? Well, you, how's your voice? Let's let's take questions from the audience. And uh, go ahead. Just what you just said. Um, so, uh, sort of reflects the the them and the us and the Republicans, Democrats, and and, the, and public power could be seen as socialistic. So, to, to how how to speak to this? Because this could be a unifying issue if we knew how to speak to it. Well, you know. Uh, there are over 2,000 publicly owned electric systems in the United States. There are millions of Americans on social security. There are millions of, of people who are on uh, Medicare. There, we have to realize that in our lives, government has a, a role. And, but what we've seen is that in America, there has been socialism for corporations. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, let's get real. Government has been used, government subsidizes corporations. They do it through wars, they do it through, uh, oh, yes. reg, you know, not regulating, they subsidize for corporations. But when government is asked to subsidize something for the people, the corporations go, whoa, how dare you, that's un-American. Well, no, it's not. So, you know, we, we have to, in a way, you have to dismiss it. It doesn't require a lot of explanation, got it. It doesn't require a lot of explanation. It requires that we just have to be smart about this. It's, you know, this is public power, and, and we have uh, certain rights uh, in a democratic society. This is as uh, American as, as apple pie. And what's more, where else in America is apple pie uh, made more effectively and more deliciously than Washington State, right? Okay, another question, and I'm sorry my voice is giving out a little bit, but I'll keep trying. Go. Ahead. Um, business owners, property owners, and their property taxes, homeowners, etc. What role does the renter have? Well, a, a, a renter would. You know, it depends on your on, on your lease or rental agreement. Uh, if a if a renter uh, has to pay a utility bill, you want to keep the bill as low as possible. If your bill, if your rent, if your utility cost is built into your rental agreement, uh, if the if the utility rates go up, you're going to be paying more rent. So the whole thing about about control is that at a at a local level. You, your neighbors and friends who run the utility are going to be more uh, conscious of the effect of their decisions on you. The idea is to keep rates as low as possible. And private utilities have a difficulty doing that because they have to observe the interests of shareholders and of, of paying the salaries to their executives. And so I, I just want to say one more time, that if, if anyone here works for a contracting company that works for uh, PSC, my feeling is that you want skilled people to work for this utility, and they ought to have a job. And if they have experience in doing that, that's who you want to hire. And so they should have, right? I mean, do you agree? So I want, I want the people, if there's anyone here who works for, for uh, in an arrangement with PSC, you ought to hear what your neighbors just said. There, this isn't, we don't want to split people up. We don't want to cost anybody their job. We want to give people a chance to know that their jobs will have more security and their, pe their pensions will have more security if it's, if it's connected to uh, public power. Uh, yes, ma'am. They tried to take away, PSC said, in Jefferson County, the PSC said, oh, you're going to lose all those PSC jobs. All those guys work for Jefferson PUD now. <laughs> that, well, that's the idea. Uh, I don't really have a question. I have three comments that I've observed living here. One is that PSE did have a customer service office on Pacific. 
it's now been closed. Yep. Yeah. So the only way you can contact them is online or by telephone. Um, your comment about renters, my observation about most of the new apartment complexes that are being built, they do not have gas, they are electric, and they all have really small cadet heaters, which are incredibly inefficient, heating large spaces, which means the cost for these goes up considerably all the time. And it's far less expensive for them to put in cadets than it is to put in effective heating systems. Um, and finally, in terms of reliability, um, I have a friend who worked at the state for seven years. His comment to me was, when I moved here, I have never worked anywhere where the power went out so many times, and all of us who work for the state would have to pack up our laptops and just go home. Yep. He said. So that's another, you know, that's another aspect of this for at least the Olympia area because of the state offices here. Wow. <laughs> for those who are guiding this campaign. You just received a, a testimony as to some of the issues that can drive the success of this election. I, I do want to say, though, just you may not be aware of it, but while it's true that they closed their customer service office, I, I heard that they reopened it in Manitoba. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add, uh, for the reliability issue, I want to uh, couple back to that for the renters especially. Uh, PSC or whatever private company can turn off the power if they feel it's in their best interest. In California, when they had the, the fire uh, caused probably by the explosion of the electrical um, uh, uh, facility, uh, later on that summer in November, uh, uh, California Edison actually turned off the power in areas because they didn't, they were afraid of causing fires, and yet dozens of people in the hospitals were out of power for days and days. So, all over the state. This is where, um, here again, you see how private corporations will assume uh, a, uh, almost a, uh, a royal prerogative they're doing what's best for them. I mean, you know, let me tell you, if anything like this is even threatened or could happen, you just need to have some attorneys part of this campaign to go right into federal court and, and, and challenge their, their actions. Because um, the whole idea of operating a utility, it, utilities are guided by several levels of law. They're guided by federal law, they're guided by state law. And it's, you, you know, if you're going to start cutting back service for whatever reason, you better be able to argue in court because uh, you can you can have a major lawsuit and they can have damages that would you know enable you to buy their system at a discount. Uh, gentlemen, I'll, I'll come back to you. Go ahead. Can can credit unions buy the bonds for? I don't know the answer to that. The question is, can credit unions buy the bonds for PUDs? I don't think so, but I can't say that I really know the answer. I would, I would doubt it. I'll come over there. I can give you a quick answer, which is the PUD floated a bond for their water, and they made a choice. And Chris, you can, I think it's true. They, they said, we want a certain percentage offered locally. So they said like 15% of our bonds are going to be offered through local banks and credit unions for local purchase. So I think just, that was just to speak, guy. We just to speak to that a little bit. Let, let, excuse me, let Guy speak to that. So, so I mean, actually, uh, public utility districts can get preferred loans. I mean, I've, I have I produced a white paper that looked at some of these issues. And uh, it, it's true that, you know, actually they can get cheaper loans than say even the corporations can get. Um, I, I do have a question for you, though, Dennis, uh, of my own that I'm curious about. So, in 2012, um, I was vociferously attacked by certain people, uh, and the issue seemed to be an objection to upsetting the status quo. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, but I think that.
think this is actually something that people are concerned about. And so I, I, do you have any advice about how to handle that kind of a situation? <laughs> I mean, look, the whole history of America is upsetting the status quo. <laughs> Creating a more perfect union is upsetting the status quo. Uh, and when people come together to challenge a government, you're upsetting the status quo. Uh, the uh, and so uh, the status quo was made to be upset. And, 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 and don't feel bad about it. I mean, it's like, you know, that, we're as a badge of honor because uh, you know we have to challenge this. Uh, if any of you are familiar with English literature, there's a poet by the name of Shelley who wrote a poem called Prometheus Unbound. And in that poem, he talks about defying power which seems omnipotent. Uh, this, uh, thy great titan, is to be joyous and free. And so we, we find our freedom in, in these moments of, of challenging power that seems that you can't touch it. And literally, we're talking about power in a, in a metaphorical sense, but we're talking about challenging power literally as well. And, and that's something that is our right. I'm going to go over to this lady and then to the gentleman. Uh, people are sitting in the first two rows. There is a lot of liquid on the floor there. Be careful you don't slip. That's all, yes. So a couple questions. One is that my memory of the past, 2012, is that um, PSE in at the very last minute especially, and they flooded the media with um, fear about the prices increasing. So my question would be, um, does that happen? I mean, just realistically, does that happen much that, you know, that, that uh, PUDs really go under or they, you know, really experience higher prices or something like that? And the other question would be, how do you deal with the equipment? Like, if PSE owns all these lines, do they get turned over, or how does that work? The, the, um the transmission and distribution system and, and any generating capacities or substations they have, all are part of the deal. They're all part of the deal. And fit, they figure into the amount of money they'll be owed for the, for the takeover. Now, as far as fear, we, can't, we cannot walk in fear and faith at the same time. It's impossible. You really have to have faith in each other and faith that you can make this happen. And when they try to drum up fear, the better you're organized. To organize street by street, this is the importance of organizing. You can go right back and talk to people. And you have to tell people, look, this is what they did the last time. They stirred up fear. And then they moved out of town. And they, all, and they don't even, they don't, they're not even from Washington State. You tell that story and you say, look, we're not, we're not going to be intimidated. This is time for people to practice courage. Will, will that happen? Will they come up with a crazy campaign at the end? Uh, you know, absolutely. You can count on it. But you know what? So what? So what? You push back. And, and, and knowing that. And you, and you need to tell them. You know, it doesn't mean that the people who are guiding this are not going to be smart and have strategies to deal with that. There's a lot of ways to deal with a, a company which is, whose headquarters is truly in another country. And so they're, they're really at a disadvantage. You want to talk about uh, the difference between being a, a home team and the visitors. They are really the visitors in this one. And uh, I, would, I would think that the Seahawks always did better at home. I was hoping they were going to make it to the Super Bowl. Sorry they did. So it's not uncommon for us with ice storms or snowstorms to lose power for three or four days and for people who are farther out in the county for a week or even more. Is, it, is this a normal occurrence? Well, you know, with, with changes in the weather, all utility, whether they're owned by public or private, are going to be challenged. And so in that case, you have to make sure you have enough linemen to be able to reconnect. And you have to be guided by the weather. I mean, you know, you can promise people reliability. You can promise people an effort to lower rates. You can promise people to bring the money back into the community. But you can't promise people the weather. And so, you know, but you can respond. And so you have crews that are available to go out in emergency, and they need to have enough crews to do that. So you don't have to wait several days. Uh, as long as, you know, if the storm stops, 
it's wrong that anybody should have to wait several days to have their electricity hooked up again. Do you see those that even have all local workers? They have to bring in people from other states sometimes when we have storms, and they're too proud to ask public utility districts that are their neighbors for help. So we're literally paying way too much money to fly in other workers from other states that aren't even local. And I talked to Mason County, their oldest PUD in our state, uh, one of the oldest ones in the country, and yeah, their base rate is $40, uh, but their kilowatt hours are cheaper, and all of the money that they make goes back into their utility. They have thicker gauge wires, they invest in all of their new equipment, um, they're investing in fiber optics and underground options, um, which Washington needs to do. And Puget Sound Energy will never be doing any of that. You know, as you're talking, and thank you, let's uh, thank those young ladies for here. After this. The campaign, it's urgent that you put up a website, get the word to everyone here, and, and post these stories. Because people need to share their experience and their knowledge of what's happening in other places. Because when they're, if you are bringing in out-of-towners to do work, well, first of all, the money's not staying here, but you're paying a premium. And if you have some, uh, the requisite number of personnel on the ground for the Thurston uh, County uh, Public Utility District and you know, Public Power System, you, you can staff it so that people are going to be able to respond. And you can staff it at a rate that is uh, much cheaper than what it costs to bring in power. Uh, we have a higher population than Mason and Jefferson, so we have more people that are going to be getting into the system, so the rates will be cheaper than Mason County. Well, there, uh, there you have it. I'm going to, uh, one more over here and then I'll be back. And uh, how are we doing on time, Paul? Oh. <laughs> so, how do you uh, finance the purchase of the facilities? With revenue bonds that, that public utility districts are authorized to issue under law. And that's how everybody does it. So it's not hard to do. No, it's a common practice to do it. And, and, uh, but then, that goes into the cost of that is paid off over 30 years. And part of that money that the system brings in, part of it goes for retiring the bonds. Okay, I'm going to go over to the other side here. Where so who's been waiting a long time? I'm I help me here. Okay, let me get over there. You were talking about upsetting the status quo, but for some reason, like in your own town, Cleveland, or recently in Jacksonville, nobody thinks it's upsetting the status quo to profit. As a public utility. Could you explain what went on in Jacksonville recently? Well, I understand the mayor, like yourself, refused to sell out the utility when he realized the head of his own public utility was taking up golden parachute. But that's not unusual. I mean, I cannot, people always pursue their economic interests. You shouldn't do that when you're holding public office. I'd rather be addressing you as Mr. President. No one here has mentioned the fact that uh, PSE is guaranteed a rate of return. A guaranteed rate of return would immediately go away. And uh, does anybody remember what it is? Is it 10.1%? 10%. 10%. Yes. So, what's the uh, that 10% could be used to be retiring revenue bonds or reducing the costs. Uh, do, do most public utilities receive a guaranteed rate of return or is it particularly egregious here? Uh, you know, any, any publicly owned utility, the guaranteed rate of return is actually money that goes back into the system. It's not going uh, even out of the country in this case. The, the money uh, that you get from uh, the revenue, it, it goes into the, a pool which is aimed at you setting your rates, keep them as low as possible. If you need extra help for some people in the community who are, 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 are having trouble making ends meet, you can set a special rate for people. You can set requirements for the environment. You can have control over the whole thing. That's, that's the thing. And then, you know, the, 
Right, rate of return is the reason why people have private utilities. And it's all about the, the rate of return. Thank you for bringing that up. That was an important contribution there. Okay, I'll uh, get the lady here and then the gentleman. Something I would like to add about the wonderful Australian hedge fund funded uh, PSE is they're about ready to bring in smart utility meters. And SMART, the acronym, which is greenwashed, it actually means secret military armaments as residential technologies. Wow. And this all goes for the 5G, which we're having a program at yeah. Traditions tomorrow night. Yes. We're going to explore that too. But this is what PSE is going to do next year. It's scheduled. Go on their site and find it. So you may want to consider it from that too, because you can escape this military technology coming into your homes and offices and workplaces and public places by getting on that now. And this is a very good idea and an opportunity to do it. Wow. Thank you. Okay, it's actually a comment. Um, something that wasn't mentioned is East King County, up, uh, east of Seattle is doing that this year also. And we have it here in Thurston County. And then in the city of Olympia, we are also doing this. Uh, about to start gathering signatures to get it in the city. So if we can hit them from all three sides, hopefully we can knock them out. I just want to say myself, and I see a bunch of faces around the room who have collected signatures in 2012. Yeah. We're going to do it this time. Yeah. Uh, just a show of hands here as we're wrapping this up. How many people in this room, after you've heard that your neighbors speak, how many of you would be willing to circulate a petition? Okay, I want you to look at that. That is, that is incredible. You have, when, when we were circulating petitions to save Muni Light in Cleveland, which then was a city of 750,000, we were able to get 30,000 signatures in less than a month because we had a hundred people who filed to circulate. You have that kind of power in this room. So this, you can get this on a ballot. And when you get it on a ballot, you can campaign and make it, make it happen to win. And when you get it on a ballot, uh, I will be more than happy to come back here in October for a rally. <laughs> where we bring out thousands of people and, and, and flood it out. Now, when do they, when do they in elections, you have mailings, right? Yeah, come in September. So, September, okay. Then I'll, then I'll come here in September. Because we, you have to, you, you know, you, you get ready for really, really rallying people. So, um, there's people from the campaigner with petitions. I would ask that you... Uh, they've been circulating. They've been circulating, great. But, 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 so we have people's names who are here, uh, do we? We, we get to collect some, yes. And there's a volunteer sign-up form? Yeah. I've been going around. If there's a volunteer sign-up form, make sure... <laughs> Katrina, is there, any, is there anything else that needs to be stressed before we call, call this uh, an evening? Right Go ahead. I was one of the people on the ground in 2012. We came really close to winning this. It, we've got 42%. There was a very, very small skeleton of people, maybe 12 of us. If we could have 24, 100, if we could have all of the people here doing petition gathering and then boot on the ground with after his rally in September, we can do this. We can't cover this county without the numbers. We really need people. We can do it. There it is. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. Thank you, everyone. We, uh, I don't know. Uh, in Cleveland, as part of our rally to save Beauty Light, there was a song that we all sang at the end of our rallies. And I'm gonna, I, I'm, uh, my voice is very good right now, but I all, many of you know this song. It's called, uh, This Little Light of Mine. Are you ready? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right.